For some insight into Ohio and Neil Armstrong, we are honored to have with us United States Senator Rob Portman, whom we have the privilege of working with at the Ohio State John Glenn College, College of Public Affairs. As most of you know, Senator Portman was reelected in 2016 on a platform to help Ohioans address important issues like combating the opioid epidemic and promoting pro-growth policies <clears throat> to help create jobs in Ohio. <clears throat> Excuse me. Senator Portman has been a great friend to the Glenn College and to Ohio State. He serves on the Board of Advisors at the Glenn College, and his leadership extends to the classroom as well. He previously taught four courses at the college and was our featured speaker at the first ever Leadership Forum in 2013. His importance to the college was recognized in 2011 by our awarding him the John Glenn College of Public Affairs Medal of Leadership for demonstrating outstanding leadership in public affairs by example, action, and accomplishments. It is fitting that Neil Armstrong helped present that award to Senator Portman because of their shared commitment to helping the next generation of public servants. Senator Portman had the honor of delivering the eulogy at Neil Armstrong's funeral to honor his legacy to our country. Let's please provide a warm welcome for our United States Senator, Rob Portman. Liz, thank you so much. And you just reminded me of uh, probably the most wonderful moment in my career, which was to have Neil Armstrong and John Glenn on either side of me presenting that award, and uh, mostly to see the two of them together and talk about uh, Ohio's role in, in space. Uh, we certainly have been blessed, haven't we? And uh, now going forward with this new commitment by Ohio State, Ohio State even more so, it's great to be here with a lot of really important, distinguished people who are part of uh, the space program and have been for years. Uh, my, my heroes are here. It's also wonderful to be here with the Armstrong family. I just had a chance to visit with Carol and Rick and June, and uh, they are great friends and carrying on Neil's legacy in such important ways. And to uh, Dr. John Horick, who I spoke to earlier, congratulations on this prestigious new post and the key role you now will play in also carrying on that legacy and inspiring future generations. And thanks to Huntington Bank uh, that co-sponsored this. We talked a little about that today with some of you, but this is uh, typical of The Ohio State University, getting it all right. So, OH. Thank you. That's always an easy way to get a response from the crowd, even during lunch. Um, uh, we're going to hear from Jim Hansen in a moment, and we're going to have a privilege, uh, uh, the privilege of hearing some more details about Neil's life. But I was asked to talk a little about, uh, as Liz said, you know, his background and uh, a little about the connection to Ohio. Um, I'm going to talk also about him as a friend because I was I was honored to be so, and and um, you know, it just is again an amazing uh, story of his life and an extraordinary privilege for me to talk a little about him. Human flight, think about this, for all of our history as humans, uh, it was sort of the stuff of, of mythology. The Greeks talked about it, um, the Chinese talked about it in, in their myths, everybody wanted to fly. And some very smart people, including Leonardo da Vinci, uh, thought they had it figured out, but they didn't. It took two brothers from Dayton, Ohio, named Orville and Wilbur, to figure this out. Now remember, these are two guys who did not graduate from high school and who lived in a home without uh, electricity. Uh, they got around in horse and buggy, and yet it was these two brothers who overcame the force of gravity. So right here in Ohio, it all started. Um, hard work and determination is what I talk about in terms of the Wright brothers. I gave the commencement address at one of our great universities here in Ohio over the weekend, and I used them as an example. Uh, because they never gave up, perseverance. They had a bike shop, they had a full-time job, um, but by 40 years old, they had made those ancient dreams of flight come true. An incredible story. I remember Neil saying that he was inspired by them uh, down uh, I-75 a little bit in Dayton, Ohio as a boy, and uh, that's part of the Neil Armstrong story too. Think about this. Not even 60 years after the first flight, and only 14 years after Orville Wright passed away, an Ohioan named John Glenn was in space. Incredible. 
So all those thousands of years of human history, and then within 14 years of Orville Wright's death, there's John Glenn orbiting the Earth. Seven years later, another Ohioan, a modest guy from Auglaize County named Neil Armstrong, of course, became the first person to walk on the moon. So in the span of one lifetime, we went from the age of horse and buggy to the space age. And again, it was Ohioans who led it every step of the way. As we know, Ohioans are home to more than two dozen astronauts, some of whom are honoring us with their presence here today. We're also home to NASA's John Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, and there's some folks here today from that great research center where right now we are developing more technologies to help NASA more than ever with their new missions. Uh, also, as you may know, NASA Glenn is where Neil Armstrong sort of got his start in space. It was then, of course, uh, the Lewis Research Center, but that's where he began his work in the space program. Orville Wright once famously said, if I were giving a young man advice on how to succeed in life, I would say to him, pick out a good father and mother and begin life in Ohio. We love that quote. If Orville had known Neil Armstrong, I think he might have said that Neil Armstrong was the quintessential example of what he was talking about. It was Neil's dad who got him interested in flight. He took him to the Cleveland Air Races when he was just two years old. That must have been interesting. He took him on an airplane ride when he was just five years old. That was a big deal at the time. And again, um, before he could even drive, uh, Neil was a pilot. Just three years later, he was flying combat missions over Korea. A lot of people don't realize he was a hero long before he became an astronaut. And um, he earned a number of medals, including the Gold Star, Korean Service Medal, Air Medal. He was a hero to all of us. Uh, and as a member of uh, the armed forces before he even began the process of being a test pilot and then an astronaut. Led the Gemini 8 mission, which was meant to prepare for an eventual trip to the moon. At a speed of 18,000 miles per hour, Neil docked the first Gemini, the Gemini vehicle with another radio-controlled vehicle. I think that was the first docking that was ever accomplished in space. Jim can confirm that. The thrusters on the ship, we are told, began to fire uncontrollably on that mission the Gemini began to spin around at a speed of about one revolution per second. In order to stop the spin, Neil had to use up about three quarters of their fuel. He had to make an emergency re-entry, but due to his calm and his skill, he made it home safely. I think that was a great example of Neil Armstrong, grace under pressure. And it's a testament to Neil that after that near miss and with a beautiful family waiting for him at home, he signed up for more. He was fearless, he was unshakable, he was a patriot and exactly the kind of man needed for a mission like Apollo 11. And given his skill and character, it's no wonder that he was chosen, he was chosen to be the first person to step onto the moon. We all know what happened next. We know about that historic mission. But again, Ohio is where it all started. And for Neil, Ohio was always the final destination. After the Apollo mission, Apollo 11, he spent another year at NASA, and then he came home to Ohio. Uh, as you know, he taught aerospace engineering at the University of Cincinnati, bought a farm near Lebanon, Ohio, where my family uh, and I first got to know Neil Armstrong. My mom was born and raised in Lebanon, um, and where I had the great honor to get to know an extraordinary person. Neil the person, frankly, was in my view even more magnificent than Neil the national icon. And that's saying a lot. Uh, many of you knew him very well. He had a quick wit. Uh, he always had that gleam in his eye. Uh, he, of course, was low-key, unpretentious, humble, loving father, son, husband, very proud grandfather. One quick Neil story, uh, I was asked if I would share a story about Neil, and the one that comes to mind with regard to his low-key unpretentiousness, but also uh, his attention to detail that NASA loved, one year, I was supposed to get uh, then-President George W. Bush to come and speak at an uh, unveiling of a new veterans memorial in southern Ohio. And it was a big deal for the community. At the last minute, uh, something came up. It was an international crisis, and George W. Bush had to uh, decline the invitation, and they were left with me. And, of course, I was feeling uh, uh, totally unprepared for that. and. Uh, intimidated by it, so I picked up the phone and I called my friend Neil. Now, as you know, Neil didn't like to make public appearances and certainly didn't like to give speeches. 
And I said, Neil, I, I know you're probably going to say no, but uh, George W. Bush is supposed to go to this uh, monument next week, and he, and he can't go now. And um, I wondered if you'd be willing to come and say a few words. And he said, I'll get back to you, and hung up. And I thought, well, forget that. I better start preparing my speech. Uh, Neil gets in his car, drives himself, and Carol may remember this, up to Mason, Ohio, gets out of the car, walks the, this new memorial to our veterans, talks to people there about it, checks it out, drives himself back home, <laughs> and gives me a call. He says, I'll do it. I wanted to check it out and make sure it was, you know, the sort of thing that was, you know, really honoring our veterans properly, and, and um, I'll see you there. I said, well, Neil, don't you want to know more? But no, no, I got it. So we get to the, uh, to the ceremony, and um, I went with my dad, and, and um, Neil showed up. My dad and Neil were, were buddies, too, and they sat together on stage. And there were hundreds of people there. The lawn was just filled with people. And um, no one had any idea who he was. You know, he had come quietly and sort of sat in the second row. And so when it came time for me to speak, you know, representing George W. Bush, I spoke for about two minutes. <laughs> and then I said, but ladies and gentlemen, we have a great honor here today. We have the honor of hearing from the first man to walk on the moon. And uh, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, there was just a wave through this crowd. Uh, frankly, more so than it had been my former boss, George W. Bush, or probably anybody else. Uh, people were just overwhelmed. And Neil got up there, and he gave a beautiful speech. And he had written the entire thing himself, and uh, it paid attention to detail, as always, what this memorial is about, um, who some of the veterans were from Mason, Ohio, who he had researched. Uh, he'd done his homework. That doesn't surprise any of you who knew Neil. And of course, I was appreciative, much more importantly, uh, those people, many of whom were the families of veterans who were being honored that day, were so incredibly appreciative. So that's my Neil Armstrong story. And it's a typical example of Neil Armstrong, the patriot. Uh, and Neil Armstrong, who, unpretentious and selfless, always was willing to step up to serve others as he served all of us. Ohio, as Liz has said, um, continues to play an incredibly important role in our space program. And, and how fortunate we are to be in this state. Uh, not only have we produced some of our greatest astronauts, uh, Neil and John Glenn, we're also producing the technology that makes it all possible. So aerospace is the number two industry in Ohio, uh, second only to agriculture. Amazing. And people don't realize sometimes the number of suppliers here in Ohio. I was at Metalux recently, which is a company outside of Cincinnati that uh, had received a NASA award, which is why I went there. And uh, just a number one of a number of so many Ohio small businesses that are suppliers. I'm told there are 75 Ohio small businesses alone that are involved in current NASA missions. So, you know, we're fortunate to have Wright Patterson, to have NASA Glenn, but also to have this private sector commitment to aerospace. Over 100,000 Ohioans are employed by aerospace today in Ohio. I think uh, it's only appropriate that the Ohio State University is taking on this additional commitment and uh, with the Neil Armstrong Chair. It's part of who we are as Ohioans. The Neil Armstrong Chair in Aerospace Policy at our flagship state university is totally appropriate. I mentioned a moment ago that Neil was a low-key guy and didn't like attention, but I'm going to suggest that today, uh, where Neil is, way above the moon and above the stars, he is looking down and really proud of this moment and really proud that the Ohio State University is taking up this chairmanship. And while we look back with wonder at what Neil Armstrong accomplished, uh, I'm confident that with his commitment at Ohio State University and other commitments we're making around our state, that our best days can be ahead of us for the space program. Some of us talked today about some of the exciting missions that are going on today and, and the work being done in Ohio, uh, NASA Glenn here, Battelle, uh, in the private sector. I think our best days can be ahead of us. Inspired by Neil Armstrong and other heroes, astronaut applications have hit a record high of 18,000. 
By the way, more than double the previous record of 8,000 in the 1970s. So young people today are interested, they're engaged, they're involved, and they will be here at the Ohio State University more and more. More people want to be part of this next stage of scientific discovery. And again, with this professorship, Ohio State is going to make a greater contribution to that. Our ancestors certainly could not have imagined how far we have come, and we can't know what the future of science and technology holds. But I think it's a safe bet that with the kind of commitment being announced today, Ohio is going to play a central role in that future. Thanks to everyone for making this possible today. It's an honor to be here, and Godspeed. It's my honor to introduce now Dr. Janet Cavandi, who serves as director of NASA's John Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. It is NASA's only field center located in this state, and so it was very important to us that Dr. Cavandi have the opportunity to address you over the lunch session so that you can fully appreciate all the fantastic things that goes on in this state. So Dr. Cavandi, if you don't mind approaching the stage. Dr. Cavandi is a scientist and a NASA astronaut. She's also a native Midwesterner. She is a veteran of three space shuttle missions and has served as NASA's deputy chief of the astronaut office before taking the helm of NASA Glenn Research Center. Please join me in welcoming her. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for being here today. I'm so glad to welcome you on behalf of Ohio's NASA um, establishment here in the state, and uh, we are very proud of the state, very proud to be here, and of the work that we do at the NASA Center here. Um, following Senator Portman is not an easy thing, and he talked about many of the things I was hoping to talk about, but I will go ahead and not waste this wonderful speech. Uh, it is short, and I do have a video to show you, and I think that actually portrays a lot of my message as, as well as anything I could say here. But Ohio does have a long and illustrious aerospace history, dating back to the earliest days of controlled human flight. Orville and Wilbur Wright went from building bicycles to building aircraft refining their technological developments in a Dayton, Ohio workshop before taking to the air at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina on December 17, 1903. Since then, Ohio has not only produced other famous aviators, but also 25 astronauts. Ohio is one of the top two states in the nation to produce our country's space explorers, including John Glenn and Neil Armstrong and Sunita Williams, selected to be a NASA crew member on one of America's first commercial space flights. The Buckeye State has much to be proud of when it comes to exploring space. From the earliest days of NASA and the beginning of the Mercury program, Ohio has figured prominently in the development of the nation's human spaceflight program. In 1959, NASA received over 500 ast astronaut applications from around the country, mostly from fighter pilots. The finalists were evaluated at the Air Force Research Laboratory, AFRL, in Dayton, Ohio, about 70 miles west of here. After that testing was complete and all the other evaluations, only seven astronauts remained. They were the Mercury 7. They next traveled to NASA Glenn, where they underwent two months of testing in the gimbal rig, which was used to help train the astronauts astronauts on how to regain control of a tumbling air, aircraft or a spacecraft. You will see this and other interesting images in the video that I'm about to show. It features um, Ohio's native son, Neil Armstrong, our namesake, John Glenn, and the early space explorers, some of whom are here today. And it showcases NASA Glenn Research Center and what we're doing right now to prepare for human space flight missions that were coming in the future. So if I could have the video, please.
NASA Glenn this past year we did a lot of testing on the Orion spacecraft and simulations thereof and also a lot of work on our aeronautics site as well. So be happy to show anybody around who's interested in coming out. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. For more than three decades, James R. Hansen has written about aerospace history and the history of science and technology. He is the first and only person to write the authorized biography of Neil Armstrong. The, the biography, First Man, The Life of Neil A. Armstrong, was published in 2005 and has spent three weeks on the New York Best Time Seller list, New York Times bestseller list. The book described Neil's involvement in the United States space program, culminating with the history-making Apollo 11 mission, while also detailing his personal life and upbringing. It was awarded the American Astronautical Society Eugene Emmy Prize for Astronautical Literature on the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Outstanding Book Award. A native of Fort Wayne, Indiana, Dr. Hansen earned a PhD at The Ohio State University in 1981 and has taught history at Auburn University since 1986. His teaching and research has received numerous awards and accolades from the university. He was inducted into the College of Liberal Arts Academy of Teaching and Outstanding Scholars in 2005. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. James R. Hansen.
Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, sadly, it seems, I grew up uh, across the state line in Indiana. <laughs> but I was smart enough at least to come here to, for graduate school. Uh, Neil once remarked to me, you know, here he was an Ohio boy that went to school in Indiana, and I was an Indiana boy that went to school in Ohio. So we had, we had that in common. Um, the organizers of the event may want to slip me a note or something. I, I know we're running behind time, and I know you have a one o'clock uh, set of sessions to start or a session to start. So everybody's waving me on. So I, I will. I'm, I will try to cut this as I as I move along uh, through this. But uh, uh, you know, Indiana has a proud history, not just claiming Neil. Uh, I mean, Purdue obviously is very very proud of Neil. Neil's papers are at the Purdue archives, um, and uh, they're quite a, I wanna say some things about those papers in a minute, but you know, in terms of astronauts, uh, Gus Grissom was a Hoosier native, uh, and uh, Frank Borman, I think, was born in Gary. Uh, Jerry Ross, who flew seven shuttle missions, uh, the late Janice Voss, who flew five. So, um, Indiana has a few things to say about its aerospace heritage as well. Somehow I failed the astronaut test. Maybe it was that I was on the wrong side of this border. Uh, but I did manage to become an aerospace historian, one uh, lucky enough to live vicariously, to live out vicariously the story of many of America's great adventures in space uh, and explore for readers uh, some of the science and engineering uh, and other creative human talents and experiences that went into them. Um, I guess in retrospect, and I actually have just retired from Auburn University um, uh, just this past month. Uh, I'm, it's not that I'm retiring, I've got two book contracts coming due in the next, next year. But in retrospect, I do feel almost destined uh, for me to take up these stories, in particular to do Neil's biography uh, the distance from my home on the south side of Fort Wayne near the airport and Neil's birthplace in a farmhouse just outside Wapakoneta is just over 60 miles. Uh, the road connecting Fort Wayne and Columbus was and still is U.S. Highway 33, uh, which just west of Wapakoneta passes just a couple miles from that farmhouse where Neil was born and then right into Wapak itself uh, with inside of the Armstrong Air and Space Museum. Um, when in school here at Ohio State, I was here from 75 to 81 for my master's and my doctorate, uh, I must have driven that road between Fort Wayne and Columbus, um, which passed through Wapakoneta a hundred times or more, uh, never imagining that I would one day become Neil's official biographer and, or I dare say, even his friend. Gosh, it will be soon five years since Neil's death. Five years this August 25th. It, um, it's been, um, you know, almost in 2019, it will be 50 years from the time of the Apollo 11 uh, event. So we'll be celebrating a, a, a golden anniversary in 2019. And I'm a little bit biased, and maybe you are too, but I think history seems to be more interested than ever in understanding the remarkably unique character of this extraordinarily private person that was, that did become the first man on the moon. A ghostly TV image in a clumsy spacesuit climbing down a ladder a quarter of a million miles away and becoming the first of our species to set a foot on another heavenly body was virtually the sum total of what the world knew, of who the world knew as Neil Armstrong at the type, time of his historic Apollo 11 mission that iconic astronaut frozen in time, July 20th, 1969, remained the sole identity of Armstrong for most people right up to his death 43 years later. Um, but fortunately, I, thanks to Neil's agreeing back in 2002 to my authorizing, to my authoring uh, his biography, I enjoyed an, uh, the rare privilege of getting to know Armstrong for who he truly was, a down to earth, yet deeply complex and brilliant three-dimensional human being. Why Armstrong chose me, a university history professor, 
to write his life story when any number of authors had approached him is a question I never dared ask him. I mean, imagine, I mean, like once I got the permission, what was I going to do? I mean, why, why pick me? I just left that alone. Uh, yet it's been one of the most asked questions of me ever since First Man came out in 2005. Uh, as to Neil's reasoning for deciding to participate actively in my project by giving me access to his papers, allowing me some 55 hours of tape-recorded interview time with him, uh, sending me, I counted this up one time, I, all of my materials have been sent to Purdue as well for the archives, but I had over 600 informative emails from him. I mean, this is a guy who, if you got, got an email from him, it was like getting a message from the Archangel Gabriel. Uh, and I have over 600 emails from him, most of them in response to specific questions I had once I was working on the book. Um, I can only speculate, really, as to why uh, he did agree to my uh, offer, my interest. I think I came into his life at the right time. We were both Midwesterners with ways of speaking and... and, and um, manners of socially interacting that were very familiar to one another. Um, uh, more than that, we were also, also both offsprings of mothers and fathers whose families had made their living in farming. We came from farming families. Uh, and also it seemed crucially important to Neil that I wasn't out to sensationalize his career or personal life. And that I appreciated, though I wasn't an engineer myself, that in my previous 20-some years since leaving Ohio State working in various ways as an aerospace historian, that I appreciated what engineers do and how they do it. I appreciated the technical side of his lifelong, not just his spaceflight, achievements. Um, and it certainly didn't hurt that he believed that he could trust me. Uh, the biggest compliment he gave me after the book came out was that I wrote exactly the type of book that I told him I would write. I hadn't sprung any surprises on him. Getting to know Neil, I never forgot the heroic aspects of who he was and what he had achieved. I mean, that was kind of hard to do. Uh, but Neil was such a good and honorable person that the icon quickly retreated to the back of my mind, and I appreciated him and the remarkable life uh, that he led for so many other good reasons, most of them related to his basic humanity. All his life, in whatever he did, Neil personified the essential qualities and core values of a superlative human being. Uh, don't just ask his fellow astronauts, uh, ask his, his fellow naval aviator, his crewmates in Fighter Squadron 51, where as a young man, barely 20 years old, uh, he not only flew 78 combat missions over North Korea, but showed Extraordinary levels of commitment, dedication, dependability, uh, self-confidence, decisiveness, loyalty, positive attitude, integrity, uh, judiciousness, and, and a lot, lot more. Uh, as for the moon landing, no human being could have handled the bright glare of international fame or the instant transformation into a historic and cultural icon better than Neil did. It was just, it was just in Neil's mild and modest personality to avoid publicity and keep the real business of the engineering and piloting profession he had chosen center stage. He was simply not the sort of man ever to seek what he felt was undeserved profit from his name or reputation. Uh, and he, as many people have emphasized, you know, Neil always mentioned that the 400,000 plus people that had been part of Apollo uh, emphasized the teamwork, that he had been perhaps with the other astronauts at the top of that pyramid, but in fact, that there had been nothing foreordained you know, about his becoming the commander of the first moon landing or becoming the first man out onto the lunar surface. As he always explained, that was mostly the luck of the draw, a series of contingent circumstances. Still, he had done what he had done, and he understood what great sacrifice, what commitment, what extraordinary creativity it had taken for all of the whole country to get there. Uh, and I think he was immensely proud of the role he, he played in the first moon landing. Uh, but for him, it shouldn't turn and didn't turn into a circus performance for him uh, or any sort of money-making machine. Uh, in other respects, Neil chose to, to leave that particular stage of his life to the history books. 
It was like golfer Bobby Jones, and of course, Neil loved golf. It was like Bobby Jones never playing competitive golf after winning the Grand Slam, or Johnny Carson never again appearing on TV after leaving the Tonight Show. Neil, not that Neil lived the life of a recluse after Apollo 11, that's a myth created, I think, mostly by journalists frustrated with not getting interview time with him. Uh, after the moon, he lived a very active life with many more accomplishments to his credit in teaching, in research, in business, in, uh, in industry, in exploration. And he lived it all with honor and integrity, just as one with the real right stuff should. Um, in the extraordinarily modest, unassuming, and private way he lived his life after Apollo 11, it was clear that Neil understood that this glorious feat that he and his crewmates had helped to achieve for the country back in the summer of 1969, glorious for the entire planet, would inexorably be diminished by the blatant commercialism, the redundant questions, and the noise of the modern world. The nobility of his character just would not let him take part in any of that. He was not a man that could be bought at any price. He was never about himself. Uh, as a, f a following anecdote shows, I'll have a couple stories of mine to tell. After word came out in 2002 that, that I was writing Neil's biography, actor-director Clint Eastwood hosted Neil and his wife Carol and my wife Peggy and I for a night stay at his private golf club, Tehama, up in the hills above Carmel Bay in California. Clint was interested in possibly making a Warner Brothers movie based on my book. Uh, the next morning, Eastwood invited Neil and I had to play a round of golf with him. Uh, and as I had to go in, it was kind of rainy, uh, and I had to get a rain jacket I didn't have, so I, was, I came down and headed to, to try to find where our golf courts were. And I, as I headed to the golf course, I saw Neil taking his bag of clubs off of Clint's cart and, put, and putting them on another cart and moving my clubs onto Clint's cart. And so I went up to Neil, I said, what are you doing, Neil? And Neil said, I figure Clint will have a lot more to talk to you about with the movie than with me. And I instantly moved the bags back. I said, I, I don't think that's his idea. I think you really need to be riding with Clint. But the truth was, Neil could have cared less if a movie was ever made about his life. He, but he knew that I cared, and that's the only reason he had agreed to even visit Eastwood. Um, not surprisingly, the two men didn't hit it off that well. Neil didn't like the violence in some of Clint's movies. Not, I don't think Neil told him that, but he had told me that. And Clint apparently appreciated space cowboys more than he did real engineer astronauts. Uh, eventually, Eastwood gave up the rights to, the, to Universal Studios, which, as you might have read, is now just about ready to per put First Man into production with Ryan Gosling starring as Neil. And uh, this is the screenplay is being written by an Academy Award winning screenwriter, Josh Singer, and being directed by an Academy Award winning director, Damien Chazelle, and both Josh and Damien are here today, I think, and I'm, they don't know I'm gonna ask, but would you stand up and let everybody get a look at you, Josh and Damien? There's Damien and there's Josh down here. Neither one of them were old enough to, are old enough to uh, remember Apollo 11, but they're gonna do a great job, great job with the film. Another story from, from that trip, um, playing that golf round. We were on the third green, I think it was, and Clint had like a 20-foot putt, which he missed, but he came fairly close, so I hit it back to him, and it was a gimme. And now it was Neil's turn. And Neil wasn't a, a great golfer, but he loved the game, and he was particularly focused on his putting, uh, which was actually pretty good. So Neil, it was Neil's turn now, and he got over his putt. It was about a 10-footer, and I think it was for a par. And he was really, he wanted to make that putt, it was clear. And just as he was about to hit his putt, here comes Clint's ball rolling toward the hole again. Well, surprised, you know, Neil was obviously in the midst of putting and he flinched and missed the putt badly. 
Uh, but he didn't say a thing or act like anything untoward had happened. Several holes later, Eastwood was off on another side of the, of the fairway, and I went up to Neil and I said, what did you think of that when Clint, you know, his lack of etiquette back on the green? I mean, here was a guy that was a member at Pebble Beach and at Cypress Point and had been playing in the Bing Crosby and the AT&T Pro-Ams, and, you know, he, and he's hosting Neil Armstrong at his club, and here he is playing out of turn, hitting this extra shot. And so I asked Neil, what did you think about that? And Neil's reply was, eh, it's his course. He, I guess he can do what he wants on it. <laughs> and that was Neil. That comment reminds me of what Neil said to me when I asked him during my interviews for the book, what did he think about the fact that Buzz Aldrin had not taken any photographs of him when they were on, the, on their EVA on the Sea of Tranquility? Uh, you all know about that, right? They're the pictures that we all know, the famous pictures, remarkable color photographs of the astronaut coming down the ladder, the famous boot print in the dust, the astronaut saluting the American flag. Those are all pictures of Buzz. We don't have pictures of Neil. When I asked Buzz, why he didn't use that Hasselblad camera to take any pictures of Neil, and he did. They switched the cameras out and he used, he, he did take pictures. The best Buzz could say was, it wasn't in the mission plan to take the pictures. So the only pictures we have of Neil are the one with the reflection of Neil in Buzz's helmet visor, or a very few pictures where Neil's standing in the dark shadow of the limb with his back to the camera, or you just see part of a backpack or something. Um, so you don't have pictures of Neil, the first man on the moon. You don't have pictures because Buzz didn't take any. And so what did Neil think about that? I asked him in one interview. He said, ah, I don't think Buzz had any reason to take my picture. And it never occurred to me that he should. And I've always said that Buzz was the far more photogenic of the crew anyway. Um, I guess that's why so many of us feel that he was the perfect person to play, to be in this role. Another anecdote, um, and I'm really, if you, you guys need to give me a kill sign, just let me know, because I don't, you know, I was planning for 40 minutes according to the schedule, and <laughs> it's not working out that way. Um, on September 17, 1962, millions of Americans tuned into the popular CBS television game show, I've Got a Secret, hosted by a TV personality by the name of Gary Moore. The old folks in the crowd know, know all about this. That night, September 17, 1962, the two guests on the show with The Secret were Stephen and Viola Armstrong of Wapakoneta, Ohio. And their secret was that their son, Neil, had just become an astronaut, part of the second class of astronauts just announced that day by NASA. If you've never seen this episode, you've got to get on YouTube or Google it, and it's just amazing. Um, and it was even more amazing for me because, um, well, at the end of it, Gary Moore, the host, reads a little bio about Neil, about young Neil Armstrong, uh, and they he talked about how he recently flew the rocket-powered X-15 to more than 3,900 miles per hour, and over 207,000 feet. And at that point, Gary Moore turns to Viola, Neil's mom, and says to her, now, how would you feel, Mrs. Armstrong, if it turned out, and of course nobody knows, but if it turns out that your son is the first man to land on the moon, how would you feel? To which Viola answered, well, I guess I'd just say God bless him and I wish him the best of all good luck. But it's just the the prophetic nature of this. Well, you know, it's a sensational moment just watching that episode, but for me, it was even better because Neil had never seen this episode. You know, he was busy, too busy working the night that it actually aired in, in, in September 1962, and he had never seen any replay of it. So one day while I'm at the Armstrong home with Neil and, and Carol, my wife Peggy was also with me this particular visit, I bring the videotape of the I've Got a Secret show and ask if Neil would like to see it. And the only VCR in the house uh, was back in the master bedroom. So we go back there and Neil sits on the end of the bed and Carol, if I remember right, 
is on the floor and she puts the tape into the machine. And together the four of us watch Neil, Neil's parents on I've Got a Secret. And the whole time it plays, and I've now watched it probably half a dozen times, I'm watching Neil just to sort of see his reaction. And it's classic Neil. He, he watches it very closely but without giving away any emotion. Uh, of course, his parents have both passed away by now. They both die in 1990. So it's been 12, 13 years at this point since he's, you know, since they passed. And I wish I could remember what all he said. I don't think he said much, but I remember him saying, all I remember him saying was, mother looked well. Nothing about himself, nothing about the prophetic words of Gary Moore about what it would be like if he happened to become first man on the moon. Just mother looked well. No ego, no self-importance, no vanity at all. His modesty at times would, could tickle people around him, I think. Uh, one evening during my research, Neil and Carol and Peggy and myself, we went out to dinner at a local Italian restaurant near their home. And over a good bottle of wine that Neil had ordered, we had a great meal and even better conversation, very, very friendly. And as we were leaving, I saw Neil quietly move over to Peggy and apologize to her for talking too much. Well, I, that just cracked me up. Uh, Neil Armstrong talking too much. I mean, who had ever heard of that? Um, it, it hadn't happened that evening either, but Neil thought maybe that he had been a little too boisterous and felt that he needed to excuse himself to my wife. I'm amazing. Neil had to be very balanced and good-tempered or he would never have survived the mountains of fan mail that came pouring into him years in the years over uh, following Apollo 11. I mean, all the astronauts get a lot of this type of mail. I'm sure Al and Mike and, and Jack Schmidt here with us today could tell us stories about, and, and Walt, about the mail, mail that they received over the years. But may I pol politely suggest that their mail is dwarfed by the sheer volume of mail that Neil had to deal with for the four decade plus years of his life. I'm going to try to cut this down for you so we can, you guys can move on to your next session. Uh, I thought I already knew what it must have been like, what it must have felt like to be Neil Armstrong in the years after his becoming uh, the first man on the moon, just from my biographical research and, and, and doing all of the reading and studying that I had done. But last summer, I spent a month in the archives at Purdue where Neil's papers are now located. And in that archives of his alma mater, amidst all of his other papers, rest over 70,000 pieces of, of fan mail that were sent to him in the years following Apollo 11. And I read, not word for word, but I read every one of them. More than 70,000 letters, cards, telegrams, emails. Um, and we know that that 70 to 80,000 that are preserved at Purdue uh, that that's only a fraction of the complete correspondence Neil received over the years uh, because for a period of time in the years, in the months after Apollo 11, Neil was getting over 10,000 pieces of mail per day. And if you do the calculation, if Neil was getting 10,000 pieces of mail per day, let's say five days a week for just say six months after Apollo 11, that comes to 300,000 items. And during that same time stretch, Neil and Mike and Buzz made their 45-day world tour to 30, 23 countries. Neil made a three-week Bob Hope USO tour to entertain the troops in Vietnam. And he also made a 10-day trip to the Soviet Union, only the second American astronaut to make an official visit. So waiting for him in Houston when he got back from all these trips was some 300,000 cards and letters that was, he was now supposed to answer with thousands more to come. Neil, NASA did its best to help, uh, sort of. Uh, one of the letters in the Armstrong papers at Purdue is from a man named Smith from Castro Valley, California, dated July 1972, in which he actually had written to President Nixon in the White House, complaining that Neil Armstrong had not yet thanked him for the gift that Mr. Smith had sent him back in late 1969. And answering for, for, for Neil, who had resigned from NASA in August 1971 to become professor of aerospace engineering at Cincinnati, 
Answering to Mr. Smith was NASA's Deputy Assistant Administrator for Public Affairs, a Mr. Alabrando, who wrote back to this complainant, quote, we regret very much that you have been caused any unhappiness by what seemed to be to you a lack of proper handling of your gift to Mr. Armstrong. At the time of the lunar landing, the astronaut office was not prepared for the veritable avalanche of mails and gifts that flooded the office from all over the world. It was unbelievable. An average of ten, over 10,000 letters a day were received for quite a while after Apollo 11. The outpouring of affection and appreciation for the accomplishments of the Apollo 11 crew was deeply gratifying and appreciated by the astronauts and by NASA officials. However, the sheer volume posed uh, logistic, administrative, and clerical problems. Um, the astronauts themselves, when time permitted, helped in set, writing the cards of acknowledgement, and it is quite possible that the handwritten card you received was written by Mr. Armstrong himself. And I'm taking the liberty of sending your letter that you sent to President Nixon to Mr. Armstrong, because if he knew how you felt, he would want, you, he would want to write to you directly and thank you in a more appropriate manner for your gift. He is that kind of person. He was that kind of person indeed. But how does anyone reply to hundreds of thousands of cards and letters that are coming in? Um, to make a long story short, uh, you know, as he moves to, when he was at, still with NASA, there were two or three secretaries who were assigned to help him with the mail. Cincinnati assigned two or three. When he leaves Cincinnati, he hires a woman, Vivian White, who for many years triages his mail uh, and makes sure he sees what, the, what he should be seeing, uh, sending out more f standard letters. I mean, Neil kind of wrote a number of different standardized letters in response to different sorts of topics, and they could go out um, under um, his signature uh, for a long time. Uh, when I interviewed Vivian White for the book, uh, she did say, about 1993, Neil realized that his autographs were being sold over the internet. Many of the signatures he found were forgeries, so he just quit signing. Still, we get letters saying, I know Mr. Armstrong doesn't sign anymore, but would you ask him to make an exception for me? Since 1993, form letters under Mrs. White's signature went out in answer to 99% of the requests, which she categorized into 11 boxes, depending on what they were asking from Neil. Letters that asked personal questions, many of them pretty invasive personal questions, Mrs. White put into file 11, which was the wastebasket. So I'm doing a book for the 50th anniversary that I think people will enjoy seeing. Uh, I th the preliminary title, the tentative title is Dear Neil Armstrong, Letters to the First Man on the Moon. And I'm going to publish um, 200 or so of the most interesting letters that were written to him over the years. And it's not really, in some cases, his replies are there as well. Um, but the letters are pretty amazing. Uh, I just want to, I'll just read you a couple. I took notes after the second day of eight hours of reading through these letters. I took notes about what these letters were, were about. And I'll just read you some of from my notes. So many requests for so much stuff, autographs, pictures, brochures, books, Mostly from children, but also many from adults. Most are very polite, but some aren't. Um, many are writing, they say, to get Neil's autograph and then gift it to a child, a grandchild, a father, a friend. Some of that was probably true. So many of them want to know how Neil felt when he walked on the moon. Good luck. People ask for a genuine hand-signed letter, don't want auto signatures. Several, people, several children want him to come eat dinner at their house, they tell him to bring his pajamas and stay for a sleepover. <laughs> I'm not surprised, again, these are my notes. I'm not surprised by how many charities are asking him for support, but I am surprised by how many letters come in directly to him asking for money, mostly for educational or medical expenses. Several teenage girls have fallen in love with him and are writing love letters, some weekly, with enclosed pictures and perfumed hankies. Many letters from people asking about God, religion, spirituality, the soul. Some of the letters are very bizarre. Several people who are in prison and mental institutions are writing to him regularly. There are dozens of letters that Neil keeps in a folder that he has labeled quacks, mostly believers in UFOs, people with crazy invention, inventions and conspiracy theorists. I could go on. I mean, the barrage was never ending. People wanted so much from him, more than he could ever give, but he tried. It was very hard for him, but he, tr but it, but, but he tried. Um, 
And just to let me wrap this up, let me just read you a couple things uh, that are, show up in the letters that are, again, show his sense of humor. Uh, oh, there's one story that I've got to tell. It's another golf story. Um, again, showing his modesty, but how witty he could be with it. Once at a pro-am golf tournament, a lady came up to Neil on the putting green and declared to him, aren't you somebody that I should know? Neil's answer, probably not. <laughs> but he could also be sharply honest in making a point. In, run, in response to one letter he got in 1974 from a Michigan man who was trying to get Neil to, to agree to part, be part of a great American's poster project, Neil answered, you are certainly welcome to drop in any time to discuss your proposed project, but I, but I don't want to imply encouragement. I can't think of any reason why I would want to appear on a poster. And then to a man in South Africa who wrote him in 1975 with a poem that this man had written about the twinkling of stars while Neil and Buzz were on the moon. Neil wrote back, I'm sorry to report that stars do not twinkle when viewed from space. I have observed many, both with the unaided eye and through optics of various powers, and I have never observed anything but steady light. Well, life is full of disappointments. I suppose you'll have to write a new poem. <laughs> and just one more, and to show you how he could write, some of his letters were beautifully written and very heartfelt. There was a, a group of sc school children, social study students from a school in Front Royal, Virginia, who wrote him in 1974, and he wrote back to them, you asked the question, do you feel that our country has understood the importance of the exploration of the moon? Well, no one completely understands the importance of the events of his own time. History sometimes reveals that importance, but not always. Space has become a part of man's universe, and he will continue to explore and exploit for all the rest of his history. How long that history will endure is somewhat more difficult to predict. Continue to search for the solutions to our problems. I think you'll find the searching is as much fun as the finding. Sincerely, Neil Armstrong. And he wrote, there's lots and lots and lots of letters like this. In closing, let me just, just say this. For the opening epigram to my biography of Neil, First Man, I selected what I felt was a profound sentence from the book On the Art of Living, written by American mythologist Joseph Campbell. And that sentence read, the privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. The privilege of a lifetime is being who you are. I think Neil enjoyed that privilege, and all of us should be delighted that it happened just that way for him and for us. Thank you.